I'm going to sort of buck a little bit of a trend. I'm going to fight Boeing's corner here because the Model 247 was, for me, the, the, the first proper <laughs> liner. It, it had everything you know, the DC-2 emulated. And, you know, it had it was stress-skinned. It had retractable undercarriage. It could carry people in relative comfort. Yes, it wasn't built in numbers. Where, where Douglas came up strong was they, they appreciated and they listened to the customer. Welcome to the Damcast. Brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Brad Bowen. When we say civil aviation, we tend to think airliners. And going on holiday, travelling for work, going to see family, all that good stuff. But when you're looking at a hundred years of civil aviation, there's a lot to cover. And that's what author Ben Skipper has done in his new book, 100 Years of Civil Aviation, a history from the 1919 Paris Convention to retiring the jumbo jet. I'm delighted to say Ben joins me today and we start picking some threads from his book as we try to delve into just what civil aviation is and in the great scheme of things, what it means to us today. And of course, what it means in the future. So, Without further ado, we're going to jump straight into this. The interesting point you made that we were just chatting about is that there hasn't really been a good civil aviation book for quite a while. And for me looking for guests that are non-military, it, it was it was really nice to see this one come up. So was that the reason for you getting stuck into it? Well, the, the history of the book itself. I um, the, the, background, the, the background for the book came from a discussion with an editor over at Pen and Sword. And we, we and he was just a, a throwaway comment um, you know, she made. And I said, you know what? I said, I, I think it was around her kids. They, they, they're after a book about flight. No, I, I can't recall. It was about, this was about three years ago. And I thought nothing more of it. And then she approached me and said, would you like to do a history on civil aviation? I thought, yeah, well, that's fair enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm anything if not flexible. Um with with my past writing, I've done everything from, you know, um, bloodlines of bulls <laughs> through to horses, through to equitation, through to military history. Uh, <laughs> and my background as a historian all lent itself to researching civil aviation. You know, you, you can see definitely a foundation there for civil aviation. So I thought, yeah, I'll give it a bash. Um, and I genuinely thought it was going to be so straightforward. I really did. The naivety was off the scale. So that when it came to getting the research, plan the research, because at this point it was just let's write about it. There was no, there was no plan. I thought I'll look into it, and the, well, most of the books were written in the late eighties, and the late from late seventies through to sort of the late eighties, there are there are a few books, and they were fab, they were brilliant, they were great, and then the nothing. It's like you know the nineteen nineties happened, and everyone got sidetracked by um, grunge. Uh, Euro pop, cheap flights, and I just didn't bother writing about civil aviation because you know we reached the pinnacle. We've got the seven four seven, we've got Concorde, uh, we've got package holidays. Nah, let's just forget about it. And that was really infuriating because, as you know, when you're, you're writing histories, you're also looking at the, the social trends of the time. And so for thirty years, there was literally nothing apart from one very good book. Um, but that was pure legalese. And I didn't have a clue how to read, properly read it. I understood the premise. I understood what the author was getting at. But that was about it. Now, I know DK have their flight books. Um, but it's all very short, very snappy. Look at it, flick through it, read two pages, and that's it. And it doesn't give you any insight and it doesn't develop the theme. So I got back to the editor and said, well, we can do it. Um there is an awful lot of work involved, and, and what do we want to talk about? And that led to quite a few discussions. So the, the chapters that we've got, the eight chapters are there, they're the result of these discussions. Uh, and one of the things that the, ed- the editor, Karen Cox, was exceptionally keen on me including was a section on women in aviation. And she's absolutely on the nail, and I know we're going to be talking about this, this later. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other elements, you know, um, that we perhaps, have, you know, they've been overlooked. The effect of civil aviation in, in in wartime and uh, terrorism and through to its you know it's back to basics so my mindset was civil aviation started 19 whatever up to 
20, it goes up to 2020, literally on the cusp of uh, the COVID pandemic. And I thought, that'd be easy. Really straightforward. Because most of it happened in the, you know, most of it seemed to happen in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I don't know, that'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, that didn't quite happen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that's how it so that was that was the sort of the background into the writing the book and, and, and generating the ideas um and there was then lots of spider charts uh discussions a lot more spider charts um and coming up with a plan um and how to write about it and the, it was one of those things that the more you looked at it the more there was to it um and it became exceptionally complex mm-hmm if I was to draw a comparison with the, you know, with the B seventeen and the B twenty nine books, they're very straightforward. They're very formulaic. You, what you have is your tin. I know. I, I always try and find out some information that's not been included in other writing, and slip it in the book, just to make it unique. And I do that with all my my stuff. But with civil aviation, it, it was it really was very much an open goal, and trying to find that best piece of information. Because I guess when you're looking at a single aircraft, you literally have a beginning, middle, yeah. and end, really, don't you? It's it's either the the start and end of the service, the stuff that goes on in the middle, or it's today we're doing this with it, and that and that's the end. But the the, the question I really wanted to fire in at this, because that's all very important for the discussion that we're going to have, because this is a massive subject. It's you know we tend to think civil aviation, oh, it's airliners, fine, off you go. As you've just clearly pointed out, yeah, not not so much. But what do we mean when we say civil aviation? What was your sort of terms of reference when you were putting this together for what you'd be able to include and what you were going to be pushing out? Now, this is interesting because this was this was self-led. How do you define civil aviation? Now, I mean, the, the, the inner squad in me wants to be a smart ass and say, mm-hmm. it's aviation with a please and a smile. Um, that only gets me so far. <laughs> so it was defining... <laughs> The, the civil, ele- you know, as you say, the civil element. And, and when you look at it, civil aviation, yes, you're right. We, we tend to think of airliners, don't we? We think of bright, smiley people coming off their, you know, their, their, their cattle freight airliners, landing at somewhere exotic, diving straight into the pool. Um, what we don't tend to consider is um, space travel. You know, big element of civil aviation. We don't tend to consider... Fire and rescue, the emergency services use of civil aviation. It, they, that, that is, it's almost <clears throat> external to civil aviation. We don't tend to consider civil aviation um, as something that covers model aircraft flying. I mean, we're, we're talking the FAA have these wonderful, and they have been since the 50s, competitions of free flight, of um, radio control. I mean, these things are really quite big big events um racing aviation racing yes we you know we've got the red bull races the red bull challenge we've just had reno that's just finished um air races but that that, that belongs to a history um what else we you know we've, we've got the the aeronauts the the, the, the air balloons the hav um heavy air vehicle which has which has a profile that looks rather like a backside um <laughs> there there are so many elements to it You've, and then you've you've always got the, the development of the innovation, which is ongoing. So, it was it was literally a case of splitting it down to themes. You know, going back to what you were saying about beginning, middle, and end, and then you know um, diversifying those. So you have women in aviation. You have the establishment uh, of airlines and air routes, which I'm, I'll, I'll talk about you know, when, you, when you sort of come to that point. Um, You've got the use of and, and, and how aviation was used, particularly in the very early early days, in the immediate post nineteen nineteen period. That was that was the most for, that was the formalisation of civil aviation in terms of flight by powered aircraft, and that's quite important because aircraft. When I use the term aircraft, I use it to cover everything from seaplanes uh, through to dirigibles, through to wide body aircraft, um, through to gliders. And, and that, that's 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 a key point because it is such a vast range of, of subjects. But in terms of flight, you know, humans have been flying now for three hundred years uh, through the use regularly, anyway, that is documented through the use of you know balloons, hot air balloons, the old Golfier brothers uh, with their experimentation, right on through. 
so he, he was devising a timeline and working from that. And going back to your original question, what is civil aviation? Well, civil aviation is, is in my and this is personal and it's very subjective, is flight without military interference. Um, now, if you look at the current development, especially in terms of the space race, I, I like I like the it term is though, inter- isn't it? interference. <laughs> yeah, if the, the, and I think that's right. It is a flight without military <laughs> interference. Um, and there's be some people going, "Oh, you can't say that." Well, you can. You know, civil, civil aviation is is a lot. It, the sum of its parts are greater than its meaning. But simply put, is it, it is literally flight without military interference or with, without a military means to an end. Be it surveying, be it space flight, be it you know the the launches of the Ariane Five in Kourou or the guys going out gliding at the weekend, or the young people um, having fun with paper aircraft. Um, it, it's, it, I think it's a lot more than we than it appears on the surface, is what I'm trying to get across very badly. I hate to bad. And I'm probably causing a few eyeball rolls right now. <laughs> no, that on my podcast, it's all eyeball rolls. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's... I have to say, I loved the introduction because there's something about monks throwing themselves off of towers, which just 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 makes everybody happy. And it seems a strange place to start. But I guess when you're talking about how we get to the flight that we understand now, when we get to the aeronauts in the 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 late 18th century, early 19th century, they had to come from somewhere. And that part of it is just you know fantastic. You know, poor, poor old Elmer strapping tra- strapping some wings to himself and and you know well, I, i've got it here um he got 755 yeah. feet and didn't he break both legs something like that why are we laughing but... it's an appalling thing to do isn't it really <laughs> it is it's, it's really so, funny, it's and, really it is, funny. It is, it is, and i'll tell you what actually elmer the moment he flung himself forth into the into the void as it were from the top of marlesbury abbey which is sadly no longer there i don't think um or oh, but he was he was pretty much got rid of uh, in the Reformation. And for those of you who weren't aware, Malmesbury is in in England. Uh, what's like Gloucestershire? It might be Wiltshire. But what he hadn't done, he had his his moment, his leap of faith, quite literally, um, was important for two very two reasons. <laughs> the first was that it it identified that flight needed something extra to actually fly you needed something extra and this be, this was developed into the rudder um it was the rudder that helped stabilize and, and guide the other thing was it and this wasn't touched on for quite some while and people haven't really fully appreciated until powered flight um was the effect of moving air on structures or turbulence <laughs> and somebody did an experiment um quite i think it was in the 50s and they they, they redid it and they found the reason why he crashed so violently um, and was because the wind was hitting the tower at the time. And so it, you know, it destabilized him. And if he'd had a rudder, he'd have been all right. So it showed that he was he was about 50% there, apart from the broken legs. Um, but the fact is that despite this, he was allowed to carry on with his experiments. But it was the, and you can imagine the conversation. Yeah, Brother Elmer's at the top of the tower again. Yeah, make sure he doesn't jump off this time. You don't want to stop him, Mabbit. No, no, just leave him be. And I just think that was really remarkable. <laughs> there must have been bets going feet on. Last time, we'll see how me, far we'll go now. Sort of chapter amongst <laughs> people giving it. Yeah, he's off again. How far? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> And I think it's important to, you know, not only for the humour, and I wish you'd never laugh at somebody injuring yourself, but the, and it is the, the, the sheer faith that what they're doing is, is going to work. And I think that's, that's guided flight pretty much from the get-go. You know, we, the, at some point, somebody's looked at a bird and thinking, I can do that. Icarus is the classic example. Um, right back to the Chinese emperor who strapped himself to his chair Surrounded himself with fireworks and blew himself to smithereens, and, and and you know the outcome of that was oh, he must have succeeded for he has disappeared. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's one way of putting it. That's, 
through to the Persians. You know, he's they disappeared, use, uh, but fight. there's bits of him over there. <laughs> I'm about to say there, he's yeah. just yeah, the, the big area. Um, so there was uh, so El- El- Elmer's obviously Elmer's jump from the tower was perhaps not as destructive or as impressive as the flights by the you know Charles of Persia and emperors of China, but it just showed that what was possible. Uh, and the fact that he he did manage to glide, um, and then that's almost echoed today in, in the base jumpers, um, with, with the with the sort of monkey, mon- spider monkey, flying flying squirrel suits, which yes I know they don't have um, a rudder, but they are, I imagine that Elmer's suit would have you know his flight suit was possibly quite tight, hence the reason why he literally sort of went into the deck, um, like a like a slab of monk. Uh, as opposed to gracefully gliding, because base jumpers they have these suits which have got a lot more gear and a lot more flexibility. Plus they've got a parachute. He didn't have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got to move on from monks, otherwise this whole podcast is going to be about flying monks. So let's start looking about when we can start considering civil aviation becoming something. Because realistically, civil aviation comes first and then gets co-opted by the military come... I think, yeah, to be fair, the, the, the Wrights famously knew the only way to make money out of it was to sell it to the army. But once we have the Great War and aviation technology does leap forward, is that really in that post-war 1919 period onward? Is that when we can really say that that's the birth of modern civil aviation? It, it's a very good point. Um, I, I would say, yes, in terms of the organisation of civil aviation, yes, it was. But civil aviation was was really starting to to get get going pre-war. You know, 1911, uh, Lou Berlio, he crossed the channel. He fired so many imaginations. And within 24 months, you had um, these great air um, air expos taking place in France and and, and to lesser extent in America. And the public's attention was captured by um, the glamour of flight. And if you look at some of the, um, the posters of the time, they were really selling it as, as something amazing and glamorous. But I think I think what happened with, with the onset of war, the unfortunate onset of war in 1914, was that it, it, it sped aviation along. And what was seen as a rarity suddenly became quite a common occurrence. You know, by 1916, military flight had developed, powered flight had developed to such an extent we were having dogfights, which five years earlier, which is simply unthinkable. The whole um, technology behind flight had changed and we become more sophisticated. Um, and so really, it was the, and I know I've sort of said about the military interference, but it was the military that made flight more accessible, therefore it increased in the public eye. Because rather than having people building aircraft in their, their sheds or in their barns, as they were doing pre-war, we had a whole manufacturing process built up. And so, yeah, you know, you, you're right in that extent, you, in, in that that sort of sense that because we'd formalised how we made, built, flew and maintained aircraft and we'd allowed wider accessibility, I think the, the, the post-war year, the immediate post-war years were the establishment of civil aviation almost as an industry. Prior to that, it's been a cottage industry done by people like uh, Barman's, um, Curtis, the Wright brothers, who they were they were busy arguing amongst themselves over legality left, right, and centre, and so Europe were leading the way, but they were leading the way in in a very Edwardian sense, insofar as they were seen possibly as a little eccentric, and it wasn't until you know midway through the First World War that people started to realise that aviation actually was was fully capable. Um, of being greater than the sum of its parts, and, and that, and any discussions, especially around um, flight in legal terms and treaty terms, were completely changed. And hence, when we had the the 1919 Paris Convention, where the book sort of starts, that almost rubber seals, doesn't it? This is the start of formalised civil civil aviation. You know, before we had civil aviation, now we're formalising it. Now we're saying well, there's a set of rules to it. Now we're saying what you can and cannot do. Um, and I think that's, at that point, civil aviation can be said, yes, it's we're born, we're here. Um, and it, it, it became, it. I wouldn't say it was his coming of age, but it was most definitely his beginning of his adolescence. Because I think that's quite important, because one of the bit you talked about sort of the, 
some of the more recent books being quite legalese about the various conventions that you, you discuss in the book and how that formalizes things. But that idea of airspace and sovereign airspace, what happens when you fly over another country, that really sets in motion or it comes out of the war, doesn't it? This this idea of you know, death from above bombers that would only become even more so 20 years later. But that codifying of things that we kind of take for granted. Those of us that have worked in the industry, you learn about the, the various freedoms and things. But that's coming up almost from the infancy, isn't it? This idea of the air above a country belongs to the country. Therefore, there are rules for operating through it. And that immediately starts setting things in motion for the direction of which aircraft manufacturers, operators and passengers will then move through. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, prior to then, the, the you know the, the initial, the early stages of, of establishing a legal framework for flights over a sovereign territory and over sovereign airspace and intriguingly sovereign uh, waters was based on maritime law. I think possibly for, because it was the only thing that within the within the minds of the jurists and the politicians would possibly transfer um, more naturally to flight than perhaps you know passage over land because that, that that's you know land passage is completely mind-boggling and mind-blowing even now in the 21st century <clears throat> and it was interesting in 1908 there were discussions about how aircraft could be used and one of the, one of the big things was the the use of certainly airships as purely civilian um, methods of flight so no carriage of bombs you know uh, no dropping of bombs, no carriage of munitions. There are a whole load of, of things that they were sort of said. We want, we don't want, we don't want to have um, happen. We don't. We, we're happy to have your airship over us. Just don't drop a bomb on us. Because fly was conceived and perceived as a peaceful occupation, as a peaceful pastime, um, but within the remit. And you had, and then you had to deal with the with empires. So the British Empire yeah. wanted their way of doing things. Which would try not only cover, you know, mainland, uh, the United Kingdom, but it would also transfer to territories in India and Southern Hemisphere. You had America who wanted to do pretty much what they wanted, which they were doing anyway, in fairness. Um, but then they would have to contend with next door in Canada what they were doing. Um, the French and the Germans were exactly like the British. They were protecting empire. They were protecting their borders, and they 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 perceived. An air border, as it were. So come 1919, one of the big sticking points had been removed, and that was the central powers, the empires and central powers. They no longer had the clouds. So you literally had three main payers were um, the British Empire, the French Empire, um, and the Americans. And they were able to, to look at the experiences of the Second World War and realise that you can't put an imaginary border in the air, so you have to work with each other and you have to... Um, and, and coming together and cooperating was far easier um, than putting up air, air borders. And they're also helped by the fact that the, the you know the, the new reddest administration within within Russia were quite keen just to get on anything that was modern. They were so desperate to socially and politically advance um, the, the, the communist ideology in, in some, that they would take on anything new and. and and sign up for it and people forget that they weren't closing the borders at this stage stalinism hadn't hit they were desperate to progress to the state of um the central european countries um uh, in particular and one of those ways was accepting new ways of doing things and new ways of behaving and how does that start to shift because we again thinking in a modern mindset we think the passage of civilian aircraft into the airspace is immediately going to be people but Originally, the priority was very much communication. It was mail, wasn't it? How, yeah. how, how, do, how do the two start coming together into something that we would probably recognize as an airline today? If, if we're really... just going to look at airlines to start with as opposed to private flying and, and, and things like that. Yeah, no, no, airlines is a really good place to start um, <clears throat> because that is where civilian aviation grew. So going back to community lines of communication um i'm gonna get I've, I've thought about this actually before we came on so i'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot prior to aviation that's handy yes and it's always got to be prepared but 
with aviation building at the time it was, we, we had introduced wireless. Wireless was pretty new. It was becoming widespread. But because of the technological limitations and our understanding of how it worked, we needed something a little... We, we had to rely on um, the sea passage of uh, me messaging. Now, if you've got an empire like the British Empire, it could take up to six, six to eight weeks to get a letter from London to New Delhi or Sydney. There's, there's a lovely example um, from late 1800s uh, where when Alaska was, <coughs> pardon me, Russian territory. Um, and there's a bishop in Alaska and he wanted to, or a priest, sorry, in Alaska, who wants to contact his bishop who was based in Archangel. So he sent him a letter. And it was to ask his permission, basically to redecorate the exterior of the church. The letter took uh, two years to be responded to because of, of the distance they had to travel <laughs> and the methodologies. So when you had, so, so of course the empires, Immediately post, in the immediate post-war period, they suddenly realised, hang on a minute, we can fly a letter A to B in days, okay, possibly up to a couple, couple of weeks max, far quicker than ever before. So all of a sudden we're, we're strengthening our lines of communication, as you said. What else goes with that, you know, with, with the <coughs> mail? Well, some of that mail is going to be government business so you're going to have to have a courier couriers aren't a new concept so the couriers would start going um, and this is where you see former World War II aircraft such as the H4s being converted into albeit really makeshift aircraft but they were saying they were able to take a couple of passengers and up to 200 kilograms of, of, of um, mail that's a considerable amount of whale, mail and so what what they have to do next is work out the flight plan, the routes. That often included mainly going through stages of flight over territories that either you either owned or friendly, and doing it, you know. And, and so people would go out and advance and map these. Um, now, in the case, for example, of uh, the Belgian government, when they wanted to operate in in Congo, in, in Belgium in Congo. That that took on a life of its own because all of a sudden they were they were flying in a very to, to get to the Congo was straightforward enough. They would hop over um, Europe. They would speak very nicely to their French neighbours who would let them refuel at Casablanca, Senegal area. You know, then they would hop down again, possibly stopping off um, with another friendly nation such as themselves. And then they get to the Congo. The problem there is that they're on in, and this is, this was faced by all. all uh, of, of the operators at the time was there was no infrastructure so there were two ways of doing it um, you either make this the infrastructure or you adapt the aircraft for for the environment so this saw, saw the, the start of the adoption of the, the, the seaplane which had been really you know these were new they've been around since about 1906 the Curtis bug was, was one of the first I believe and so all of a sudden what we're seeing is people were marking out routes shortening communication times and realizing that not only can they get a air mail from a to b but they could also spend send specialists which and i'm going to fall back on the british empire because it's just a default setting at this time for the moment was easy and, and helped manage the empire because the post-war british empire was it was starting to wake up politically and therefore the pushes for independence from a lot of countries and uh, most notably in India required more political attention and, and this meant that people had to be taken as well as, well as letters we were, we were beyond you know society was getting more sophisticated so we couldn't actually just rely on a letter strongly worded letter from the from the foreign office going to the viceroy's you know <laughs> the viceroy's office he had to go with someone now in America what was quite interesting was that they they, they took a, a different approach and they took it further uh, Flight in America was doing was slowly burgeoning. Things like aircraft, like the Jenny, for example, uh, post-war, were being bought left, right, and centre. Um, and America's, a, as you know, it, it's a big old country. Mm. Nowadays, it can take six hours to cross on ordinary air, aircraft. the The rail infrastructure was good, but it wasn't brilliant, especially between east and west. And you had this sort of void in the middle. It still needs to be communicated with. So what the Americans did. They literally produced um, 
it, it almost in miniature an empire level of communications where aircraft literally hop from point to point to point carrying um, the mail. Now, these flights, and I'll mention these flights because this is where we start to understand the early logistics of airliners because not only were they relying on the establishment of certain um, support networks, technical support networks, such as emergency landing sites, um, refueling points, navigational aids. Um, they're also relying on something that wouldn't break down, that would be firmly serviced. So that brings up a whole new level of support. We're seeing now the beginning of service support for civil aviation, which would be later um, used by the American Air Force and the Royal Air Force and other air forces around the world. It was exceptionally complex because it hadn't been done before. And it was then breaking down the flights into, into acceptable journey times. Because, yes, you're going across in land, but these were really hazardous flights. And this was highlighted when, in the early 30s, um, the government decided to scrap the, all, all the private charters and get the army in to deliver the mail. Because, you know, army pilots, they're the best. I think within a week they'd lost 13 on these routes, which showed you the importance of knowing the routes as these civilian pilots had done, very much like the pilots of the Mississippi. You know, they have that short section of river, three miles, I think it is, and every pilot knows that river, and it, and it transferred to the air as well. Um, you know, we have an equivalent of people crossing the Alps. That was a, an exceptionally dangerous flight, um, and initially you would have people and airlines in particular, trace around flying over the Alps. They would sort of come down through Germany, get down to Austria, um, hook, a, hook a left or a right, depending on which way you look at your map, and go into northern Italy and down that way. And then you also needed the technology to develop so that somebody brave enough could actually make that first flight over the Alps. And the same with America. So as the technology got better and the aircraft got better, they got stronger. We then start to see this sizable shift from me, not just one or two passengers and some mail, to all of a sudden the passenger becoming more important because that generates money for the airline. Yes, they, you know, they, they're getting their money from the government and the subsidy for carrying mail, but they can't carry a great deal. And everyone's fighting with a piece of that certain piece of the pie. Whereas they can set their own tariffs. And so you, you now see people like de Havilland um, in particular making larger aircraft. So we've, we've gone from the early DH-4, which is two passengers plus some mail, to aircraft like the Ju-13, um, DH-16, which is slightly bigger and able to carry both mail uh, and passengers. This is starting to, you know, and, and the airlines are getting wise is thinking, yeah, we're going to make money out of this. So you, you're looking at about 1925 onwards is the start of an airline business because then people start to charter aircraft. Um, so Croydon, for example, there were there were there was there was a charter flight often to um, I think it was twice a day to France to Paris. External of the mail. This was a money spinner. So at this point we're at this this tipping point of I want to make more money, but the aircraft aren't good enough. How do I make more money to get the aircraft good enough? You know. And it's almost this, this battle between um, the airlines, the, the new airlines, wanting to create the perfect aircraft and get the money that they need to build the next perfect aircraft, which will be bigger, larger, faster, fly higher, fly more securely, fly air people more comfortable, and getting the money in. Does that make any sense? I <laughs> it does. Yeah, totally. Because this is the crux, because... The need to talk to someone had been there beforehand. The need to go visit someone, if you look at it like that, was something that would come about a little bit later. Sending sending a letter across the world now nowadays is 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 nothing. It takes too long. You send a text. Communication, the way we interact with people, they're cyclical. They they go forward as as they are. And this is really a good way of looking at how we get to the point where in the thirties you start seeing. Douglas creating the DC-2, 
um, that fantastic to have an albatross, things like that. You start seeing things that we would recognize as almost modern aircraft flying these routes with that balance between mail and and passengers. Funnily enough, I just read for the first time Fate is the Hunter. So this is this is all really fresh fresh in my mind, thinking about Gran and his 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 various routes that they would all fight over to make sure that they they could fly. Yeah, I mean you know, if and, and going back to, to your year remarks, I'm sort of the first airliner. But the DC two is a, is a perfect example. Um, but I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to sort of buck a little bit of a trend. I'm going to fight Boeing's corner here because the Model two four seven was for me the the, the first proper airliner. <laughs> it, it had everything you know, the DC two emulated, and you know it had retractable. It was stress skinned. It had a retractable undercarriage. It could carry people in relative comfort. Yes, it wasn't built in numbers. Where, where Douglas came up strong was they they appreciated and they listened to the customer. Um, you know, Boeing you know, in the in the thirties was starting to realise that actually their money was probably more better. It was more it was going to be better invested in military growth because of what was happening in Europe uh, and in Southwest Asia, South, Southeast Asia rather than concentrating on, on civil aviation. So Douglas was sitting in the in the guideline in the sidelines, waiting for people like TWA and Pan Am to come up to them and say, We want this, can you do that? And they give us the D C two and then the D C three sleeper, which became, you know, the, just the D C three. And in that respect, that is the first from you 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 know, I think we're one of those moments we're both on the nose. It was the D C two, D C three family which became the first proper airliners. The, the Albatross, what is sad there was Second World War started, um, and it's one of those great "what might have been, what ifs." And I think we would have seen had the had the war not erupted, we would have seen a really interesting commercial war between Douglas and De Havilland um, over who could build the biggest and the best airliner. And I have to be honest. Douglas, they 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 were going to win, purely because they they had that edge on working with a customer, and, and I appreciate Lockheed worked with with Hughes especially to create the constellation, but that was two or three years down the line, and the and the you know, but it was definitely that sort of that point with the introduction of the DC two that we started to see more formalised um, airliners as we recognise them today. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are with the Pima Air and Space Museum's Learjet Model 23. Model 23 was Learjet's first small business jet. This one was owned by the Timken family of uh, Ohio, the Timken ball bearings. They were a company that made well-known ball bearings for all different types of machinery. Louise Timken was the matriarch of the family, and she was the first woman to get a jet pilot's license here in the United States for the Learjet. She had gotten a license for a smaller, like, four-seat jet beforehand. Um, the zebra skin inside on the seats was from a zebra that she shot in safari back in the day. Um, they uh, flew this aircraft uh, for many years. After they had moved out and retired out here to Arizona, they uh, finally at one point stopped flying the airplane and they donated it here to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Also on display in our Women in Flight exhibit is a red visor and red shoes that she always wore when she was flying this airplane. Um, over the years, Louise Simpkin, you know, has gotten many awards for just, you know, being who she was, you know, in Ohio and here in Arizona. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. I'm going to pivot here and go to your Women in Aviation chapter because I think it's a fantastic chapter. Thank you. And 
in this period there are some incredible women we, we have you know you've got your Amelia Earhart's and things but you have women like Louise Thadden and for me when we talk about the air, aircraft business you've got Olive Beach who is responsible basically for Beach being Beach in my yeah. humble opinion and she's just fantastic yeah. but she's she's not alone because there's this entire group of women both say of the the groups of the 99s the 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 british women as well the french all over the world doing as well if not better than the men in all of these fields as well but we don't tend to speak about them because we think of you know Lindbergh and and um, chaps like that yeah so you're right um i find olive beach really intriguing she created an empire and her empire literally spans the the very you know the start of the formula is a you know of the airliner um and it and, and ends up being involved in space travel. And the best bit about Olive Beach is she never learned to fly. She was this sort of... <laughs> I just find that really <laughs> remarkable. I can imagine... She was quite happy to sit back and let somebody else do the flying. But at the same time, um, enjoy the ride. And make that ride that she was enjoying. Um, she was... And, and I know people say you're groundbreaking and all. She was. Glass ceiling. No, she was through that bugger. And she was not taking any aggro. And, and and she showed that when she took over the company with her husband, when Walter died. She, she I mean, I, I think with her insistence on retaining Propeller, may or may not have done Beach a great deal of harm or good. But the fact that she created this amazing company, I mean, it's still about it in various, you know, even today, producing some wonderfully look, amazing looking aircraft it, it should be celebrated it genuinely should um and you are absolutely 100 percent. i agree with you on that we don't talk enough about the ladies in in that sense i mean in, in the united kingdom we yes we we have um amy johnson what about uh, lady bailey i can't remember his first name five kids mm-hmm. <laughs> Mary. Five kids decides to learn to fly and then beggars off to Africa. <laughs> I mean, the, the, and women were way more adventurous than the men flyers. Yes, Lindbergh. Well, you know, Lindbergh was already known at that point. But again, this, this boils down to uh, the male dominated world of the time because the men were going to get the, 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 they were going to get the accolades. Um, you know, if you look at the Schneider Trophy, for example, most of the pilots that were ex-military, you, you know, and so it was it was expected of them to take take the risks. Yet in America, you had the Powder Puff Derby girls. I mean, these girls were aggressive. You you read the story, people. You know, Florence Pancho Barnes. She is a personal heroine of mine. When I read about her, because I'd not come across her really, and when I read her story, and I thought, okay, Amelia Earhart, I get that. You know. Amy Johnson, yeah, and then you get ATA and the Wasp. But then you have this one person, and she was absolutely remarkable. You know, she she left her husband, um, he, he was a he was a Baptist preacher. You know, they split up. She she learned to fly. She got involved with Mexican revolutionaries. Hence the reason why she got the name Fan Show. Um, she then got involved in air racing, which was really scrappy, and it was so incredibly dangerous. And, you know, people, and, and I must admit, one of the, when, when I'm writing the book, I'm thinking, why don't we have these in Europe? Yeah, because we have this thing, you know, we don't have the real estate in Europe to do these things. And they were flying for 11 days and they were having to be self-sufficient and they had to do X, Y, and they were doing it. Um, and, you know, and they were backed up by people like um, Olive Beach. And, we, you know, with the place of women in aviation as innovators, has been almost glossed over. And I really, and, it, and the more I wrote about it, the more I thought, hang on a minute, this really is quite unfair. Um, and, it, and again, yes, we, we have some very good male pilots, but if you look at where most of the accolades went, especially in those early pioneering days, the 1920s and 1930s, they were going mainly to, to, to women flyers, you know, aviators. We, we don't talk about it. I'm lining up a chat with Keith O'Brien, who wrote Fly Girls, all about that that group of the 99s and things. And I'm fantastic. So, we're, dear listener, we're gonna we're gonna come back to that because we have we have to we have to move forward. But seriously, if you only know Pancho Barnes from the few bits that she appears in the right stuff, seriously, p- 
people look her up because she's more than running a bar at Edwards. It's yeah. she's a remarkable lady. So let's let's leap forward a little bit here and start getting into the the sort of modern age. We we could talk about the the conventions of the Arab freedoms and things like that. And that to me is interesting because I can remember doing it in aviation studies and it you cover it very well in the book. One of the things I did want to talk about was this sort of crux that we're in now, because through the 50s, 60s, 70s, hell, even not even recently to that, flying on an aeroplane was still quite an event. There was service, there was a bit of ceremony around it. It was a thing. And the aircraft reflected that and the crews reflected that. Have we reached a point where we've discarded all of that because of of cost and volume? Has volume overtaken the pride that we used to have? In, That's a really, in really, travel? really good question. Um, I think if you if you look at when we started doing cattle class, I'm going to call it cattle class because it's a slang word, and uh, but it is true. It was it was an innovation <coughs> um, that, that has this background in Australia. When a guy got war stock DC threes, realised that if he moved the seats forward by two inches, he could get extra people in, and he went for this no frills flight. Um, and, it, and he seemed, but that was but he was only intended for very short haul. I think the people were in the air for thirty minutes. That's now been adopted because it was it's all about making money, isn't it? If you look at the nineteen fifties uh, in particular. The world was so desperate to get away from the hell that it had just been through with the Second World War, and to look at something new and shiny. We had the, we, this was the beginning of the atomic age, you know, and that's reflected in these one, like you say, beautiful aircraft, nearly always finished in silver, in bare metal, um, with wonderful service, wonderful menus, and this display like say carried on till the eighties and nineties. And then something happened. And what that happened was people had larger disposable incomes. And so the package holiday really came into its own. You know, here in the United Kingdom, you had companies such as Thomas Cook um, selling package holidays for literally anyone and everyone. You had the 1830, you had no holds barred, um, full board hotels where you didn't even need to leave the, the complex because everything was there. And the only way to do it was just to make money was to cram as many people as the aircraft as possible. Shove them on there for three hours um, and, and repeat, rinse and repeat for the next four months. And as this became commonplace, I think as consumers, we got used to that and that's what we expected. And so therefore, the personalization um, service that we'd seen that was so commonplace um, from the 50s through to the late sort of 80s, slowly drifted away from everyday flight to from economy through to business and finally through to first class um and and it's really sad because there should be a push to go back to that and, and i was before we came on i was looking at the, the the figures of flight um how many people fly per year now prior to covid in 1919 it was just over four billion you know flights individual flights on aircraft it's now about three and a half billion. But there, there was this huge sort of change um, around 2004. I think post 9-11, we had that big dip. And with all the, ch the cultural changes that were happening in the aviation industry um, as well re re regarding security, they were they were just desperate to get the people in to make the money up that they were gonna they knew they would possibly lose should there be another nine eleven event and and that is exceptionally cynical and I think that's what happened and they just wanted to make money now and the only way to make money now was to cram everyone in cut down on service levels that the people were accepting um, offer cheap flights that were you know some people offer very cheap flights on the face of it but you want to put your bag in overhead locker well, that's fifty quid mate and they started playing that game. Um, which we they knew not everyone was going to buy in, so they, they, they crammed everyone in. And the, and the service levels were cut down. To, and then the service levels came down to save costs, um, which wouldn't necessarily be observed by, you know, sort of absorbed by the consumer, but, were, but would be 
we've not hit um, the, the the profit margins, and I think that's what happened. We, you know, some people became some some air, you know airlines became greedy because they were literally operating on a it may not be here tomorrow scenario in terms of passenger numbers. Um, that's really sad. Yeah, I remember those days well from working at, at GB with you know the fuel price going up as well at the same time. It was what can we cut to balance balance that the numbers are there well we'll we'll fly min crew we'll go three or four crew if we can get it we were i can't even remember considering taking seats out of our 320 so we could go down to three crew just to save that one person it was a weird time and one that we've it sort of as you're saying it sort of dipped and we've sort of plateaued at that level um ever since really for the yeah and i think that's really sad because we, we had the 50s and the 60s we were especially in the Northern Hemisphere, or, or those with Western line visions, we, we were looking forward to the future. This was the space age. We had Sputnik. We had all these wonderful things going on. Um, we, had, we, had a, we had a new uh, a new positive approach to how we did everything. And that extended, you know, in this case, to flight. Everything was pleasurable. Everything was meant to be fun. Everyone enjoyed it. Um, and you could argue, you know, with the 1973 oil crisis, that's when it started to go perhaps a little bit south because money had to be saved, as you rightly said, 30 years later. Um, and all of a sudden, the sheen started to, to go off a little. And we and with, with the advent of the package holiday, the bum, more bums on seats you got, the more money you made. Um, and, and, you know, and that's... That's really quite sad. It would be nice to see that come back, but the only people who can afford it are like, you know, people who are flying on, on, on the luxury flights and on the charters. Which is a good thing to look to because we're in this interesting phase of a lot of debate about whether aviation can continue at all due to the climate crisis. We have seen, you know, incredible aircraft like the 747 and the A380 now being being mothballed and broken up. The A380 especially only being in service for damn near 20 years and it, it's gone. We're seeing competence, we're seeing lighter, we're seeing more fuel efficient, but we have this overwhelming issue of, of climate. Do you think we have another 100 years in it or are we going to start seeing things like we're talking about the hybrid air vehicles, the airlifter? Um, we've had people on talking about electric flights as well. Putting your prophecy hat on, dear Mr. Skipper, where do you, where do you see us going after looking back at the last century? If we if we were to look back at the last century, um, <clears throat> the one thing that any 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 of all of this has taught me is that a, civil aviation is anything. It's certainly it's as tough as old boots, really, is because it goes with the flow. The seven four seven that was going to you know the the, the jump the, the you know the loss of jumbo jet has been you know mitigated by aircraft such as seven eight seven and seven 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 you know the, the replacement white bodies you know the, the, we lost the icon perhaps not the ethos the a three eighty that's always going to be there in the background I think especially you know already they're talking about restarting the production line for uh, for Emirates but in terms you know the the big one is is the carbon footprint. Of after of aviation fuel, you know, there's this kerosene, um, and and it's interesting. You 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 mentioned about you know electric aircraft. There's, there's always experimentation going on. I think where, especially for the longer flights, where they're going to have to really pull the stops out is developing hydrogen as a fuel, as a viable fuel, and they're getting there. Um, I think Get in hydrogen. I'm. I hydrogen is my thing. Yeah, hydrogen. Honestly, I think that's the way ahead for civil aviation, and I think that'll be the driver because civil aviation is an innovative. You know, you you look at space travel. Space travel is. You, you you've got SpaceX. You, so, okay, that element of getting it off the, the off the planet. Yeah, that's not perhaps the best way to do it. Not the most environmentally friendly, but it will lead to innovations elsewhere, especially I think in fuel, <laughs> because. At the end of the day, a lot of these um, private space companies, they don't they they want to spend money, but not too much money, and so they'll put the money into R and D. Um, Boeing at the moment is doing a lot of work with replacement fuel. Um, I know that this is this is one of those areas I think the military will actually lead on. The Royal Air Force has started doing uh, renewable fuel 
uh, flights. Uh, use Saturday 50-50 um, renewable fuel flights are definitely starting the trials on the B-52 all things, which actually makes perfect sense to civil aviation. You've got a half million pounds of aircraft in the air, powered by renewables. You know, the USAF are taking the strain on the R&D in that, that area, working with people like uh, Rolls-Royce and GE. Um, but I think in terms of our expectations, I think we're not low with them, but I think we have to be ready to change how we view um, the presentation of civil aviation. I think the airliner, it, it will eventually be constrained to more short haul. I think the long haul flights, unless hydrogen is suddenly the, 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 the key is suddenly turned and we, we get something amazing overnight, hydrogen's they're reckon about 10, 15 years away. So what we're going to see is the long haul flights are going to be limited to people who can afford them. They're going to become more expensive as countries put more taxation on, on CO2 emissions. Um, but then you've got people like the HAV who are just sliding in there quite, quite cheekily, literally, um, saying, well, you know, we can do this with electric. We've, we've, we've got the technology. We've got, we've, we've got the know-how. We just need the, 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 the financial backing in which to do it. Um, so it, it's, the, the shape of the airliner will change. The way in which it's presented will change. Um, and I think it'll be for the better. I mean, we're on this sort of sec second phase of very interesting developments within civil aviation. But civil aviation will always be there, one way or another, um, either through private flight, small aircraft, um, unpowered flight. It'll, it'll, be a, it'll always be there. It'll always be pushing itself because it is by its nature an innovative activity. We've skipped over so much stuff that you cover in the book. We, Annoyingly, I didn't really want to keep us with quite a sort of Western Northern Hemisphere slant, but that's kind of where we did. The book covers civil aviation in all of its forms. Go on, what's it called? Give it a plug, Ben. So it is 100 years of civil aviation, a history from the 1919 Paris Convention to Tyrant the Jumbo Jet, and that's out with pen and sword books. And as you rightly say, it also covers flight in South America, which is quite exciting. We look at Egyptian aviation le legends, a young lady who put them put away ahead. And we've also got a bit of, you know, for those who like military, we've got a little bit of a section on, on civil aviation in wartime. That's quite interesting. I include the disappearing kidnapper. No, sorry, hijacker. Cool. Didn't kidnap anyone. <laughs> got, a dis got a disappearing hijacker in there. Oh, crikey. There's so much. Um... It's it, it like I say it's it's a massive subject. Oh, we've got space travel. Uh, we we've got um, and we've we've got how the Soviets in particular really strove to establish, literally from nothing, um, one of the largest networks of, of civil aviation flight networks in the world. In a very short period of time, um, and how they use their T the TU one four four as a freight aircraft. <laughs> I think that's it. Now. I, I, I've said it before. I said it again. One of the best flights I've ever taken for having decent drinks, a good kip, and then the softest landing ever was on a TU one hundred and fifty four in Siberia. It was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the Soviets knew how to fly, and I think that surprises people because we have this we have this image of uh, you know, the, especially the Cold War Soviet era of being very um, you know, bland. Hit it, hit it, hit and miss. Yeah, it was. It was just like, well, you know, you could almost make a, a vignette, a comedy vignette about, you know, somebody getting on an AN Colt and literally being given a piece of rope to hold onto for light. And it wasn't like that at all. You know, it was exceptionally sophisticated. It had to be the distance involved covering. Not like America, where if you, you know, there's yes, there's gaps, but you would be rescued. Not quite the same in, in you know, in Russia. <laughs> so they had to be, and they were very good. And again, they they were so egalitarian in their approach to flight. You, you, you could literally ha you go from being um, a young farmhand to a cosmonaut in a lifetime. You you wouldn't you would struggle to do that anywhere else. Um, and it's in, you know, and I'd also touch on the the, the, the growth of flight in the Caribbean. Um, and they've been brilliant. The ladies in the Caribbean who have really gone on to, to do great things. Um, yeah, it, it's an awful lot, and <laughs> it's only here to write and. And it's, it's almost surreal seeing it now. 
I think most of it just seems to disappear. It's been swamped over by other things, which is really sad. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed writing it um, for all my moments of doubt. Uh, I, and thank you ever so much, Matt, for inviting me. It's very, very kind of you. It really is. And I hope, hope it makes sense. I'm not rambling too much. Put it like this. You're, you're a mate, so if it wasn't any good, I'd tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like, why, why don't you stop pressing me cold? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, right. Well, well, we we've got to be honest about this. I, I suppose the other thing we do have to do while we have you on is give the um the depressathon a, 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 a quick plug as as well, which is which is Ben's own podcast. Go on, g- give it give it a plug. It's been a bit more cheery recently, but it's uh, yeah. it's been dark <laughs> it been from sometimes. What is so it? The, Tell so us the about it. So the Lounge. The Edgerton's Lounge. Well, yeah, it, it's chaos. So what you're seeing, you know, is, is I mean, I'm now talking to you, listener. Uh, what you're seeing here is professionalism. Well laid out, well planned, well executed. The Edgerton's Lounge, if you take all those three bits away, that's, that's the Edgerton's Lounge pod, podcast. We may just start using video. Um, <laughs> oh, we've, I've had all sorts. I've had a chap on discussing the Italian influence um, in North Africa. Very interesting. Um, Italian pilots. Very brave. Um, most, but most recently, uh, we've been talking an awful lot about the the, the war in Ukraine, uh, and some of that has been depressing. Some has been very hard going, um, exceptionally hard to discuss. Uh, I've been work, been working on that with a guy called Dustin Kane, and for those of you who don't know him, and I'm surprised you didn't, uh, Dr. Philip Blood, who is a key, one of the key writers um, of military genocide, um, and, he, and he talks at length about a lot of it. It's yeah, friend friend of the friend of the pod. Yeah, it it, it is that series of podcasts, Russian World War, were the most emotionally draining I've done. Um, they were they were exceptionally hard, and I really do it. You know, if you want to listen to them, go to Fallout um, on Substack. They're there, but I, I do I do urge caution because you will find them. They will some of them will make you angry, um, some of them will make you sad. It's and that's the dog confirming that. If you ever heard that, um, it's also probably the wife's wife is home. They're not for light listening. We're trying to get away from that. I think we got there recently with our recent trip to um, to a railway museum, which was just just anarchy. Three of us just causing anarchy. Um, so no, thank you for that plug. Um, I I would say that the the series on Ukraine, which yeah, I, I jokingly said to you guys in in the chat was the depressor fund they're, they're long pods but they're key listening if you want to understand the rush world war especially with um, the, the book that chris and, and phil and, and dustin have, have have do soon as well it's that it was it, you're right it's hard going trigger warnings all over them because you don't hold back but it's a necessary topic that needed that level of of, of honesty and and um uh, bluntness at times. There was thank you. That's very kind. Of, and again, um, I'll take some opportunity to thank Dustin and Phil, um, as well as Neil Pointer, um, for, for getting rid of some of the, the mystique around the world. The, the problem that we had, uh, both personally and professionally, was the, the continued use of mythologies um, and false equivalencies, um, uh, especially with the Second World War. You know, no war is the same. As the one that preceded it, and this is very much the case, and it, and it doesn't help. Um, and there's been an awful lot of hot taking, which I call, which, which is, for me means just wild guessing. That doesn't help either. And so the the, the, the podcast they, they've led to some interesting discussions, some interesting short sort of write ups, but have culminated in, in in Putin's War, which is the book you've referred to, Matt, um, which is due out very very soon. I believe it's in October, which Phil. Uh, Chris, but Chris Bellamy, Dustin Duquesne, and a chap his name escapes me. I'm, I do apologise. Have written on. Um, I've seen. I've seen the proof of it. Again, heavy reading. It, it's not one for the bedside. Um, and, and, you, and you really need to clear your head afterwards. You really need to decompress afterwards. Uh, reading it. It's not deliberately. It's just setting out the facts. Um, so, but to to counter that little bit of de- depression, Phil, <laughs> Phil hasn't let me see it yet. So. It's um, that that's that's never a good sign when he's holding something um, back. I I he feel, I, I th- no, there's no think about it. I, he's um, he, he's 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 collated an excellent set of essays. Um, I, I would say enjoy it, 
but I would say enjoy it perhaps at an academic level as opposed to an entertainment level. I think that'd be the best way to approach it. We will be putting all the links to your book and Fallout and uh, the pod as well because it, it it is it's not always like that, ladies and gentlemen. I can I can no, I can not, no we, we, we've had some absolutely <laughs> barking moments on there. Um, if you can't laugh, what can you do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a dark humour that I retained since I left the military. Well, I, well, I wasn't really in the military; I was in the Royal Air Force. So, um, and I'm, I'm moving backwards and being forwards about that one. <laughs> but no, no it's been. Re- <laughs> thank you ever so much for your time today. Um, so I, I hope it makes sense. I don't do sort of. But it's been a delight, sir. And I, like I said, I thank you. That's really the book. So, like I said, all all the links and things in the description, dear listener. Yeah, um, and, and thanks for your support. And, and it, yeah. We're now chatting. On yeah, well, hey, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, and if you do buy the book, thank you very much uh, from myself, my family, in particular, Mrs. Skipper, the dog. Um, our daughter is at university in her second year. I'm not trying to put any emotional blackmail on anyone, but look, I'm a poor writer. I need the money. Buy the book. It's really good. It's otherwise that I have to go and get a, job, a proper job. And that would kill me. <laughs> Actually, it wouldn't. Would it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the most honest plug we've had so far from, from an author. There, definitely <laughs> I'm just let's put cards on the table. But no, I mean, but some of the, I mean, the book has been great though. It's been really good fun to write, and it's and you, you look at some of the, the customs that we've taken over. You know, flight has carried on, like entering the aircraft from the left hand side. Do you know why? It's how you mount a horse. Yeah, well, you could say that. It's I don't really think I'm out. But, Oh, you're supposed to plug, plug, plug. But if you want to know about book, a really man. strange <laughs> and somewhat unique um, air crew <laughs> uniform idea that was done in the 60s, you really need to read the book because you wouldn't believe it. I mean, and, and that bit is researched and it is absolutely 100% on the line. I see it was just how that got signed off as beyond me. That was a strange outfit and a strange yeah, outfit yeah, in more just... ways than one, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but uh, no. Right, I've kept you for ages. I mean, I mean, we're still sort of gabbing, jibber jabbing. Is there anything else yeah. you want to ask me while we're here? No, I, I, I think, dear listener, we're going to wrap this up. You're going to have me trying to get you to buy the book from the, the outro. And Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Not on that. And Matt, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me on Downcast. It's, it's very, very kind and very considerate of you because I know you sort of, may, you know, you are military centric, which do get. So it's lovely to be able to come on and talk about the book. And you're my first podcast talking about the book, quite possibly my last. <laughs> So, so thank you ever so much for your time it's been very very kind of you you're very welcome but like we said the reason it has been quite militarily militarily heavy is because there there tends to be this gap for civil stuff so yeah, yeah. well hopefully i've addressed it in the book and um hmm. who knows what will happen I mean, you know all, all i would say is i think in every chapter i could probably write another book as it were so who knows there who knows go. what pen and sword will go do well they'll hear this and they'll go hmm. And, and listener, you know, you know, please contact. <laughs> that sounds really bad. I'm probably going to get a restraining order now from Ben and Sword. <laughs> Damn it, Skipper, what are you doing? <laughs> well, we're going to hit stop before you get yourself in more trouble. Groovy. Well, thanks once again. That was a lot of fun. I'm sorry for the rambly bit at the end, but I found it funny, so I've left it in. Can't thank Ben enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. Honestly... If the book wasn't any good, I would say, but it, I really did enjoy reading it. And I have to thank Matthew Potts over at Pen and Sword for sending me a PDF of the book early to have a read to prepare for this interview. So thank you very much to them. And of course, to Ben for his time and his <laughs> willingness for us to, to mess about when we look at his work. The book, once again, is 100 Years of Civil Aviation, a history from the 1919 Paris Convention to retiring the jumbo jet. It's out now from Pen and Sword in the UK and Europe, and that is Casemates in the States. It is a lot of fun. Ben structured the book in a way that you can pick the chapters that you want to dive into. You don't necessarily have to read it from cover to cover in one go. But there's so much in there, and we kind of got carried away sticking to the things that we know more about, probably. But the breadth that he covers is really something else. So do go have a look at that. Links in the description below, of course, to the damcaster bookshop where every purchase goes towards supporting the pod of course that's still uk only at the moment also have a look over at the fallout Substack and its podcast the adjutant's lounge like we were saying 
They cover a lot of stuff, whether it's train museums or genocide. There's a lot there, dear listener. And I would highly recommend the episodes with Dustin Duquesne and Phil Blood about the Russian way of war. As we said, please do go in with caution. They do not hold back. And a lot of what they discussed gets distilled into the new book, Putin's War, which is due out soon, which is edited by Phil. Do check those out. Buy the book. Follow Ben on all the socials again, all in the description below. Next week, I'm very excited, dear listener. We're playing with hurricanes in like real life, not like we did at Duxford when we were just wandering around talking about them. We're going to go see what happens when you book a flight in BE505, the two-seat hurricane. I'm very excited. Until then, thank you for your continued support. If you want to become a damn castier, you can join us on Patreon from just £3 a month plus the VAT. You get these episodes early, no ads. You're going to be able to start to ask questions for our upcoming guests as well. So if you want to join up now and get your questions in for the likes of Roland White, do so. There's still time before I close that one down and open up the next guest for your questions. Thank you for listening as always, and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.